Hi, I'm Jeff Richard with Chaosium Inc. and you're here with us at Legends of Tabletop. So thank you for joining us again, Jeff. It's so exciting to be able to speak with you. What's been going on at Chaosium since last we spoke on November 16th? Wow, and you know, that doesn't seem like that long ago, but an awful lot has gone on since that. We've been very busy beavers. We have brought on, uh, let's see, we have hired, since then we hired uh, James Lauder full-time uh, to be the editor of the fiction line and he's tasked with one job which is to to bring back our our uh, fiction publications and he's pretty far advanced in that we'll be making a lot of announcements pretty soon on it we brought on Jason Durall who wrote the um, he actually wrote the basic role-playing uh, gold book for Chaosium some 10 years ago we brought him on to work with me as the RuneQuest line editor we have brought on a full-time marketing person, uh, and we have also brought on a full-time uh, board game line editor, Sue O'Brien. So yeah, we've 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 been you know hiring people, moving forward on um, uh, just basically making sure that we've got people working on all the key um, areas that we need them to be working on, and. Um, you know, then when we get down to the various freelancers that we've been working on, we've got a lot of Call of Cthulhu products in uh, uh, one level of production or another. And the big project that I've been working on for the last year and a half, RuneQuest, is yes. nearing it's 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 nearing that 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 final uh, end. We have the RuneQuest Quick Start, which yeah. is a short version. Basically, it's a it's a light version of the rules plus mm -hmm. a scenario and pre-gen. So all, it's all intended you know, as, as something that you can have at a con or at a game store. Mm -hmm. And it's all totally self-contained. And it's enough mm -hmm. for you to have a, 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 a good, solid session uh, with five or six people with a GM who know nothing about RuneQuest and nothing about Glorantha. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're, at, we're releasing that uh, with free RPG day. So that's just in another week. I think uh, that's the 15th and we've done a, a Mob or one of the guys will probably criticize me for getting the numbers wrong, but I believe we we have 5,000 of those going out for free to game stores that are participating in free RPG day and so go to your Go to your game store um, that they're participating get your copy of it and then run a game with your friends and this is this is um, we're viewing that as uh, this is the warm up for then later this year the final release of the RuneQuest core rules the the uh, best Jerry and the Game Masters pack which has a screen it has uh, another bunch of scenarios. And then it's got maps and cheat sheets and player aids and that sort of stuff. And we're going to release all of those at the same time. And we're uh, still on schedule to have it out at the end of the year. But we're in final art and maps, which to me as a, a creative director, that's always the, the known unknown section of producing a book. Because you never really know how long a map and and... Uh, a series of art are going to take to be finished. So, knock on wood. Yes, that it's all follows. That everything's on time, and we're able to put get this out by the end of the year. Uh, but we're we're really excited about this. We've gone through. Um, we've got the manuscript is about two weeks away from it being able to have a broader dissemination. So basically done as far as Jason and I are concerned about. And uh, we brought on Sarah Newton and Lynn Hardy as consulting editors because we wanted to bring some people in to look at the, the, the book after it was done and that hadn't been involved in the process. You know, so we didn't want to have this be Steve or Ken or Chris or any of the other people that have been really deep into this because you don't notice once when you've been working on a project for so long. For so long, you miss a lot of things later on in it. 
And so we went into, and, and both Sarah and Lynn are fantastic and they're fresh eyes. They're, uh, uh, Sarah did Mind Jammer. She did um, uh, Octum Cthulhu. She's been, you know, very, very involved as a writer using uh, rule systems related to BrimQuest. And she's given some tremendous kind of final last um, feedback, mainly on things of, of, of clarity, you know, making sure that we're presenting the, the rules and the concepts in a way that you don't need to know anything. You, you, you basically don't need to be coming to this from RQ2 or RQ3, but you can come to it and uh, it, it's just easier to approach. And, and this is the other issue that, you know, Jason and I, why we wanted to have Sarah and Lynn involved is uh, that we know that we have been in this material too, too long and mm -hmm. can't see outside of the weeds anymore. And then Lynn has been doing the same thing. And Lynn is working with us. She's actually working with us on, a, on the Call of Cthulhu line. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lynn is also absolutely fantastic and, and has been giving, has given us some absolutely great feedback. Uh, and then both of them, there's an ulterior motive for both of them because both of them will be writing RuneQuest material. And so they really want to be, they want to make sure that the core rules is the, you know, the best it possibly can be as well. Yeah, so, so they can format their material around it. Yes, yes. And, and also so that, you know, there's something when you're a writer, if you have the chance to be able to, to, clean, <laughs> to clean something up in the mm -hmm. core book so that you don't ever have to do that in your scenario and you can just focus on your, the scenario and the campaign, uh, that's a good thing. But yes. we're, and then we've hired, um, right now we've got uh, an amazing French cartographer, uh, Olivier Sanfilippo, who worked on Shadows of Esteron. He was one of the cartographers with that, is doing uh, the bulk of the internal maps. And they're just, they're blowing my mind. I mean, this is going to be uh, possibly more gorgeous than the Guide to Glorantha. Uh, and then the best Jerry is the same thing. I've got this uh, fantastic um, artist, I believe he's out of San Diego, Corey uh, Trigo Erdner, who's doing, we went with one artist doing almost all of the monsters in the best Jerry. And he's actually been working on this for the better part of the last year. And it's finally, you know, all coming together. But he's spectacular at drawing the, the musculature and the skeleton of the various creatures so that they'll look like real things. And given that Glorantha has a lot of uh, Pleistocene um, megafauna, which he's very excited about. I think his favorite piece was, uh, was actually a, a triceratops that had been girded up for uh, being used as a mount by a bunch of uh, dragon newts. So it looks, you know, oh. the, the Hellenistic elephants with the, the, the gouda. Mm -hmm. um, this is the same sort of concept with the triceratops with, it's been all painted up and has bells on it. And, oh. and oh, he just loved that. And uh, both of those books are just gonna look amazing. And I, I so bet they are, I am excited. We're we, yes, and then you know, can't 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 forget the fact that you know we're we're just churning out Call of Cthulhu material. We should have uh, two headed serpent. Um, is last I checked, and I don't. I'm the creative director, so basically, once a product is is produced in the sense that it has the art, it's been laid out, it's got it's written. I it. it you know, I move on to the next thing. So I generally don't know if people ask me, you know, when is a product actually going to be showing up in the stores? I'm usually the worst person on the team about that. But I know Thank that it's all warning us. But, well, yeah, I'm the creative guy. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the product is, the product is made uh, the moment that I know that it's been printed and then I don't have to worry anymore and I can move on. <laughs> But we've got two headed serpent and the Grand Grimoire. Uh, uh, both are completed. I think they're just basically clearing customs. Mm -hmm. We've got um, 
coming up soon, we've got Alone Against the Dark, which is Cthulhu West. So it's a oh. whole series. Of, now I'm I'm a gigantic fan of the the western as a genre, gigantic yeah. fan. And this this is this a uh, series of great scenarios uh, set in set in the old west where um, uh, you know you are uh, western settlers or gunfighters or cowboys or you know whatever whatever the classic western archetype you want to have dealing with mythos entities in the largely wild old west and they are a blast uh and we've got the other really neat thing that uh is in final production is tales of sandy peterson which mm -hmm. is Andy's return to writing call of cthulhu scenarios and it's a book of just sandy scenarios okay. uh and these are all scenarios that sandy has run multiple times for his own group at conventions but have never been published before and they are they're they're all modern Cthulhu modern and they are messed up. I mean, oh, nice. they, are messed. Better. they are just, <laughs> they are just, I think the players end up losing more sanity than the, the character, the, the investor. <laughs> uh, and then we've got also upcoming, we've got a, uh, a big exciting project, which I can't tell about right now, but that'll be, We'll be making an announcement pretty soon about it. I know, Leah. Uh, yeah, let me finish the wine, and who knows? Maybe I'll. <laughs> but um, it's one that we've been working on um, uh, quite a bit. On, uh, but then we've also got lined up. We've got this amazing uh, scenario that is set during the French Revolution. Uh, which is originally started as a Kickstarter special reward for the Horror on the Orient Express, and enough was written that we actually turned it into a full-fledged um, uh, uh, campaign set oh. during set. Yeah, it's set during the Terror, and it's Ooh. actually part of it is set right before the Revolution, and then the second half of the campaign is set during the Terror. And it is fantastic. It's actually, I think it's Mark Morrison's best work. And and Mark is one of the best writers we've ever had. And I think this is his, his magnum opus. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a great, and, it, and it plays with a lot of genres beyond just the mythos. Uh, and then we've got um, a little further up in the production process, we've got a, a book that's very dear and near to me which is a campaign set in the berlin of the 1920s and it, even though it's written by an american writer and i gave a lot of feedback on it because i'm i live here in berlin germany uh the writer david larkins has done a better job on this than any of the german language berlin campaign books have i mean it's amazing oh. i've been playing this with my uh, uh with my uh, house players who are almost all Germans and they're just mm -hmm. going nuts over it. It's another really messed up one, which is, you know, when you're talking about Cthulhu scenarios, saying something is really messed up and horrific is just it's uh, almost uh, normal. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's, that's the, um, on the RuneQuest line, the other thing that we've, we've made an internal decision on is we will be doing, uh, next year, we will be coming out with a RuneQuest Fantasy Earth line. So that is using the RuneQuest rules for the RuneQuest uh, uh, role playing in Glorantha. Uh, the core rules, combat, passion, stats, skills, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And having another setting for that, and that is uh, roughly 9th, 10th century uh, Earth. And we'll start with Mythic Iceland. Uh, and move basically through the Viking lands east um, to mythic Russia. And we've got the, the, the Varangian Rus. Um, uh, that book is actually already under commission. And then what we hope to do is, is that Mob has been promising or threatening for the, as long as I've known him to write a uh, Constantinople campaign book. And we, what we really want to do is, 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 you know, 
do something with Constantinople as a, as you know, a mega city pack. So nice. yeah, lots on that. And then, you know, I haven't even gotten to fiction or uh, board games, but should I take a pause for any questions or um, <laughs> jump right you in? Most, you most certainly can. And um, I, you've already addressed some of the questions that I've had. Um, but, 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 speaking of metal dice, Oh, I this was the Polish. Yes. This was the awesome. Okay, so that did really quite well, especially uh -huh. it did it did very well, especially since immediately before that launch, there was an unlicensed um, uh, Cthulhu themed dice package just right before that. And that's, you know, this is unfortunately this is you know the the very ease of. Uh, uh, Kickstarter is you never quite know, you know, is there going to be a similar product to mine uh, mm -hmm. right before I have one scheduled. So anyways, despite that, it did very, very well. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this is Q Workshop and they do magnificent stuff. And I am hoping to get the... the <laughs> that is That is my wonderful seven-year-old son. Uh, Finn, who Hi, is Finn. A, a side story, he is just getting into gaming, and at EternalCon last weekend, he mm -hmm. played 10 hours straight of board games after oh, playing wow. his first role-playing game. So, Might uh, I ask him, what was his favorite board game? Um, I think his favorite board game was actually Stratego. But he played Dig Mars, King Domino. Uh, he played Dino Rally. Uh, he played, uh, gosh, what was there? It was a, a kid's Carcassonne and a kid's Catan as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, but, but the old school one, Stratego, that was the one that they were, that he played the most intensely. Well, that's cool. Anyway, anyways, that was, I have no idea what I was talking about before. <laughs> metal dice metal dice anyways i should be getting my my demo samples of that really quite soon um you know it's it's kind of neat being here in berlin because those guys are over in uh poznan in poland which is just about three hours away from here so i oh, wow. i um i asked in the license agreement to get um myself well stocked with nifty dice oh cool but I'm really, that turned out really, really well. And actually we've got, you know, we uh, are, uh, this is another foreign language licensee, but I, I have to give a plug to Sandy Tour, which is our French licensee. They did uh, a very well received Dreamlands Kickstarter last year, and then a, um, a revised Masks of Neil Lahotep. Sadly, it's in French, so you have to read French to, to work it, but they they are a wonderful licensee to work with, and a lot of the beautiful art um, in the Call of Cthulhu book and in the uh, the Peterson Guide was actually yes. done by uh, Sunday Tours in house team, which are just spectacular. That's excellent. Uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, if anybody's in in Japan or South Korea, also they have been our licensees there have just been amazing. Uh, they, uh, we have a new licensee in Korea, Day, uh, Dayspring Games, and they had the most successful kicks, game related kickstart, Kickstarter in South Korean history for Call of Cthulhu. And yeah, and they're just neat, really, really neat team to work with. And, and, uh, hopefully one year, uh, myself and a couple of them, other members of the team will be able to make it out to Japan and, uh, South Korea to, to see yeah, that's the, exciting i, I would yeah, like I, to we, see what comes from from that team uh, it, simply because there's so much there's such a wide range of mythology that i am completely ignorant of that i would love to see transferred over into a format that is easily accessible such as playable call of cthulhu oh yeah they um, um, 
the biggest audience for Call of Cthulhu in the world is actually Japan. Oh, wow. It's actually I, I can definitely see that. <laughs> it is, you know, the, the sales there are, are amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, would add, I would love to go up because they also have their own take on it, and it's a different demographic than in North America and Europe. It is much more women mm -hmm. and younger women. Um, and in, and I was talking to one of their their writers, and they said, "Well, that's because you know there there is a gigantic um, gaming market in Japan, but Call of Cthulhu is the the one setting where your gender makes absolutely no difference yes. in how you interface with the um, with the mythos. You know, you can play, and and actually, to be honest." Your occupation makes very little difference, except if you're highly educated um, and can yeah. read different languages, and that doesn't have a, you know, you're just as likely to 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 have a a female antiquarian who knows Sumerian as you are to find a male antiquarian who knows. Uh, Sumerian and playing the 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 macho marine doesn't really if anything that causes you to die faster yeah and, and, and which made perfect motto. sense to me it made perfect sense to me but it was it was really wonderful to hear that that actually if we we factor in the international markets um, our I think our median demographic is actually Japanese women between the ages of 18 and 30 as the single wow. largest demographic band. Yeah. Anyways, how's that for a random fact? Hey, that is a beautiful fact. I, I'm very happy. Yes. Oh, well, Sister, and this is one of the things it. coming in <laughs> RuneQuest as well, is where really we, where we, um, we really are trying to learn that as well from uh, Call of Cthulhu and make sure, you know, I'm really lucky because my, my, my guinea pigs, my house gaming group, uh, include um, an awful lot of women gamers. And they give me very blunt feedback on, well, you know, that's just not fun or, or what. And we're trying to make sure with, with RuneQuest that we have something that's the same thing with, with Cthulhu, that it really doesn't make any difference, uh, that there's no built-in um, uh, advantage one way or another with whatever you want to play and, yeah. and and that goes in all directions it's basically the, it's one of the great charms of of call of cthulhu is mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter what you want to play you're able to have fun there's nothing yes. there's no there's no favored class there's no disfavored class it's just all you know whatever whatever um makes your day is going to work within the game system and and that's been a big design element in uh, RuneQuest as well. Is you know, you want to play the hippy dippy um, uh, assistant shaman character that is totally uninterested in anything but talking to spirits. Great, we're going to make sure that you have a good time doing that. You want to play the 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 uh, follower of the earth goddess. Uh, great, we're going to make sure that you can have a fun time playing this you want to play the war the worshiper or the god of war and death great we're going to make sure you know it yeah. basically make sure that people can um at the risk of sounding and uh, regurgitating too much joseph campbell people can follow their own bliss in their role-playing game and it and and you just basically don't set up roadblocks for them and that's i think that's a big part of the reason of the success of Cthulhu. Yeah, that and I, and with the gender wall, uh, you address that with RuneQuest. My own uh, experience, having played a little bit of RuneQuest, our our two most powerful characters were female warriors. Yeah. So definitely. Oh, in our in our current group, actually, the most powerful character we've got a female warrior. And she's the best warrior in the group, but the most powerful character in the group is the Arnalda initiate who lets other people do the fighting for her because she's not interested. Um, 
And then when she gets annoyed and bored in a combat, she just kind of wades in and, 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 and it just shocks and awe. Uh, it, but is a warrior, but all the, you know, I think she's ended up being the decisive player in, in at least half of the times that the characters have fought. Um, cause, cause she has cool magic. Uh, there was, and, and, uh, and you get to play, a, um, that's one of the character options in the, the quick start. And um, it, it's something that, that, actually what we found is the Lancor My character uh, turns out to be one of the most popular characters in the quick start. Even if she is a scholar, you know, she can handle herself in a fight and she knows all the useful stuff. You know, you know, there's, it's like in Cthulhu. Um, if you, you, if you give in a, the, if you make investigative activities important in a campaign, then investigative characters become fun and interesting. If it's yes. just a straightforward, um, uh, and this is going to sound bad because I actually like dungeon crawls, but if it's a straightforward dungeon crawl, then investigative characters aren't very interesting because they don't really have a role. But if you, they're more like a Cthulhu scenario where you have to try to figure out what's going on then, and, and that there's ways to resolve the obstacle without necessarily fighting everything in every room, then having investigators becomes a lot more interesting. And, and I actually think that, that on the long run, uh, an investigative element is always just more fun, right? In a campaign, you 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 want to be able to. I mean, it's run quest. Of course, there's fighting. You want to be able to have your fighting, but you also want to be able to explore the world and 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 and, and deal with this rich, rich setting. And we've really put a lot of effort to make sure that the rule system supports and encourages both types of play. No, and I'm, I know I'm rambling at this point. No, no. Uh, speaking of the rule system, um, I let let's review your overhaul of your licensing policies. Oh yeah, I yes. went to your website and I saw this whole new interesting post regarding your licensing policies, both for uh, personal and commercial use. Um, well, we, we really are going for three tiers. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so if you want to go and, and Leah, if you want to post uh, uh, a freebie RuneQuest scenario of your own device on, you know, for Legends of Tabletop that is not being done, commer uh, being commercially sold, you go under the, you fall under the, the personal or fan license. We don't ask for a royalty. We really don't a exercise a whole lot of control over it. We'd like to know about it. Um, mainly for obvious it. reasons. Yeah. yeah well, and also so we can promote it. But, you know, go forth and have fun. We don't, we don't want that to be an impediment. The thing that I think is really neat, um, and this was an idea of mobs, is that, okay, you want to make a little bit of money off this. You want to pay for, you want to print this out. You want to pay for the production, but you're not, you're not like, this isn't your job. You're not yeah. really doing this. The, you're not selling these products full time. So we're looking at like $2,000 or less a year. Then we have a small publisher license. The small publisher limited license. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that is so that, you know, if this is something that you want to do, it's on a small scale. We don't need to get into contract negotiation. Here it is. Fill this out. Send it our way, or or you know, comply with it. Comply with the terms on it. Um, you have to put a. There's no regular royalties, but there is a a small payment. This basically, really, it's there so that you have a certain degree of seriousness of what you're doing. Yes. Um, it's one, it's $100 a year to do that. Um, but again, that's if you're charging money for it. Uh, and then if you want to go above that, then we would issue a commercial license. 
and you know we're and then also with HeroQuest, we've got the gateway. Yeah, I was going to move on to the gateway license, and you were talking about the rules with RuneQuest and such, and I see some of the uh, fan use and licensing, the HeroQuest gateway, is that... We're actually thinking to... about going even more beyond that. With HeroQuest gateway, you can make something that uses the HeroQuest rules, and, and you can do it for commercial purposes, and you don't have to pay royalty. You know, it's not quite an open license, but it is you can use the rules and 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 we've had i think all we asked for is a couple of copies of the book now um we're thinking about going a little bit further in that direction with hero quest to let people use even more um of this but we haven't put that up you know we haven't come up with a final language on that uh but what we really want to do is we want to encourage people that if you you know, if it's been your goal to make the a RuneQuest scenario or a Call of Cthulhu scenario, but you're not a publishing company, we want to make that happen for you. We, we, you know, we think a different set of rules should apply if you are a game publishing company. Yeah, you know, because then it this is, you know, clearly that's a for-profit professional activity. But if you're doing this because of the love of of gaming we basically want to get out of the way and let people do what they want to do and we hope you know um we hope that a lot of people will avail themselves of this because uh, you know my read of this and i come from a legal background is that these these are pretty darn non-restrictive licenses particularly at the film level you know, can't read scenes so so open for yeah. just two thousand a year. Nah. It's cool. Yeah, and even the small publisher. I mean, we're a little bit more. Um, you know, when you get be, again, when you get above the small publisher, that's when we think that it's legitimate for us to get much more involved and mm -hmm. and expect a higher level of editorial review and whatnot. But if you're doing this out of the love of it, we're, you know, it's ridiculous for us to get in people's way. I, th I think so too. And I, I, I agree, applaud, and am very happy to see the, uh, that that post on your website of let's, let's do the correct verbiage here. The, uh, the new licensing policies that you have, and that is chaosium.com slash blog slash chaosium hyphen launches hyphen new hyphen licensing hyphen policies hyphen and then another backslash. I just I just had to uh, pretty much spell that out <laughs> during this interview, but uh, yeah, I am very excited to see what opens up and what comes from this and if oh, there is a dearth of new oh, material for us to play with well i'm hoping i'm hoping it generates quite a lot um the one thing you can't do with a small publisher is you can't go and do a kickstarter or crowdfunding under the small yes. publishing license now and part of the reason is there have been some bad apples um mm -hmm in the kickstarter world and i'm not going to name names but we probably could pretty quickly including some people that had had um licenses from chaosium that never delivered and seem unlikely to ever deliver and and so that's something that we don't want to just you know auto stamp uh people do wanting to do a kickstarter that that needs to be a commercial license and you know because we want to make sure even though we're not producing the product. We would we do want to make sure that if you're doing um, a, a Call of Cthulhu Kickstarter under a license from Chaosium, they actually produce it. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, I, another thing that I was going to bring up, um, what's been going on over at the fiction line? I'm going to bug you again about that fiction line. Okay, well, we are... James Louder has is now our full-time uh, uh, 
uh, edit, ed, I, I, he's had several titles, um, each better <laughs> than the previous one. But at this point, we'll just, I, I, I'm just calling him the overall editor and line developer for the fiction line. And yes. he's been tasked with getting the uh, fiction line not only up with new material, but up on a regular schedule. And that's actually the harder bit, is to make yeah. sure that there's enough material in the hopper that we can follow a regular uh, uh, product release on the fiction line, because that's necessary if bookstores are going to, to purchase it. You know, yeah. we, we can't say, if we're having a, a fiction line and we have one book come out one year and two books come out the next year and then the next year nothing else, we're not gonna get regular um, orders from from bookstores or from their distributors. And However, if it's consistently high quality such as that of Casilda Song. Oh yeah, Casilda, but Casilda Song, uh, you know, I wish with, with perfect 2020 hindsight that we were able to release that as part of a regular um, uh, part of the regular purchasing cycle because it would have gotten an even uh, a, a bigger audience and and because it's a fantastic book and, and it, you know it's a great anthology and mm -hmm. you know what we want to make sure is is that we're not just we're producing high quality material that people are able to purchase yeah. and and are aware aware of you know there's there's nothing sadder than having high quality material that nobody is aware of. And <laughs> Silva Song has been exceptional because it's managed to get awareness through the awards that it's won, that it's, it's gotten nominated for, um, and and it's been kind of the exception that proves the rule is that it's been it's done well despite the fact that we weren't in really in a regular production groove on it. And what we've we've got Jim doing is. Now let's do it so that every book, you know, can get the degree of attention that it deserves. You know, these the the, the writers of these these anthologies. You now, I've written some fiction. Fiction's harder than writing. You know, a, a decent short story is harder than writing a role playing game book. Uh, it's less words, so it it pays less. I uh, you know they're doing this. In, in large part because they love the craft and they love the, the art of what they're doing. And then as the publisher, I think it's very important for us that we're trying to get that the broadest possible dissemination that it can get. And, and you know, we couldn't have anybody better than Jim at, you know, working with writers, working with the anthology editors, but also working with the, the the process that you have to follow on fiction releases so that these these books get the sales that they deserve. That's true. However, I had the fantastic luck of being at Necronomicon at a table at your booth where there were stacks of this book. I was able to get the book there and get it signed by a number of the authors yeah, there. Signed by, by everybody on that that was there in the comic con <laughs> yes i yes. don't even get that in necronomicon <laughs> yes um but I, I speaking of that do you have anything interesting uh, anything interesting along those lines planned for necronomicon in august of this year yeah jim jim is planning on making a number of announcements for uh at Necronomicon this year. Uh, I think Mike and Nick will be the ones actually making it, but we've got, um, I think we're planning to make some uh, big announcements on our next releases for that. Our, we have, um, I can say this much at the level of generalities, um, we, we will be officially relaunching the line with another anthology, but we've also, we're also gonna be doing some books where we're taking, doing annotations of classic material. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I'm, um, I'm a giant uh, Lord Dunsany fan, mm -hmm. and I actually first read Dunsany 
uh, through the old Chiasium uh, editions of it. Uh, the the, the uh, Tales, I think it's Tales of Pagana, uh, Chiasium published back in the 90s. And I, I actually was reading that. I first found that book reading it over, um, I think I read it over at Greg's, Greg Stafford's place. Uh, and like, wow, this is amazing stuff. And, and Dunsany is one of the, the, the Ur sources of fantasy and of, of horror. Huge influence on Tolkien, huge influence on Lovecraft, uh, you know, crazy stuff. And you know, one of the projects that's important to me is is to to do mythos anthologies, but also come out and and reintroduce us to some of the the earth stories behind all of this, and yeah. and uh, line up some decent annotators to help you know explain the references. You know, yeah. Why is what on earth is he talking about? What you know? This this book was written in in 1907. I'm not get understanding some of the context. Oh, okay. Um, I did not realize this man was a a a crazy um, aristocratic adventurer in his own right and would make an awesome player character. Um, yes. You know the the. the this is something, you know, we, we want to do some of those sorts of books. We want to do uh, horror and mythos anthologies. And then the other one that I'm trying to um, get enough materials out so that people could do this is I really would like to start doing some Clorantha fiction as well with by um, uh, 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 skilled writers, not merely as fan fiction. I mean, we've got Greg and I, Greg's got a book that I've been finishing up of his, which is it, it kind of is a the Carlos Castaneda of fantasy fiction, and I'm trying to get that out. But um, you've got um, I really would like to also be doing some Glorantin short so, uh, short stories by other writers, uh, but that's also incumbent upon me making sure that there's enough material that other writers can actually write in that setting um, and have it feel Clarenthan. But we, we really, I mean, I, I really have um, a lot of hopes and we put a lot in to, uh, behind Jim to be able to relaunch this as, as well as possible. And then we've got things like the uh, uh, Lovecraft for Beginning Readers, which is kind of its yes. own thing. And yes, there will be sequels. Okay, great. Because, oh, let's see, what was one of the ones that I touched on very briefly uh, over the last holiday season? Uh, let's see, HPL's Call of Cthulhu for Beginning Readers and the Coloring Book. Oh, and the Coloring yeah, Book. Yeah, the Coloring Book. How did that go? Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's one. A lot of these things, the first time we, 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 we play around with this, we're, mm -hmm. we are learning how you market different things. Uh, yes. So uh, the Love Craft for Beginning Readers, that does extremely well at conventions. People get, once you actually see this, people just buy mm -hmm. a copy of that book. Uh, the coloring book as well, but we're still learning well, because you don't sell that like you sell a game book, and you don't sell, it. I mean, we're we're still in the learning process of that, but the the um, artist there is working with us on a number of projects. He did the cover for the the Quick Start. He's doing some of the art in the RuneQuest book, and I'm I'm pretty sure Mob is trying to persuade him to do a RuneQuest coloring book as well and a uh, follow up on on Call of Cthulhu. Uh, and and that's something else that we. There are a number of things that we're experimenting with doing that that is a we're experimenting with it to be able to learn how to to do this and release it because we we're we're convinced that there is a market there, but as a gaming company, you have to learn different ways of selling different types of product. So you sell a fiction book and. This one we already know, but you saw a fiction book completely different. And then how you would sell a gaming book. And you sell board games 
which is the thing we haven't touched on so far. Okay. Also in a, uh, How and, have those been going? Well, the Kickstarter was very successful for Conicons. Yes, we, yes. You know, we were, we were, we we made, uh, we were in the range of what we were hoping it would do. Okay. Uh, and we wanted to go with something like Conicons where we, we knew we would, it would do, uh, um, uh, within a, a successful range. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't be so, you know, we're, it actually would have been problematic if it was such a huge runaway hit. And it would have been bad if it didn't do very well. You know, we, we knew it would get, you know, in this comfortable range. Because that way we could learn things like, how do you print board games? What are the costs that we didn't know about? Um, how do you put these things together in in a sensible manner? Because it's a completely different process than producing an, uh, a role playing game book. How do you distribute it after the Kickstarter? And and so we've been learning all of that with Con Cons to be ready for our next game, which is Miskatonic University, which is a Cthulhu. It's <laughs> it's also by Reiner. It's a Reiner Kinesia game. Um, set in a university, li uh, the Forbidden Books collection of a university library. And everybody plays a professor uh, who is trying to come up to, to build up their occult collection uh, by using their grad students and hopefully not going insane in the process. Uh, and it's a hoot of a game. It's, you know, it's... Um, it's a roughly thirty minutes to play, um, but it is a it is a great Cthulhu beer and pretzels game. Oh uh, man! Speaking of beer and pretzels, I'm going to take just a moment to add in some words from one of our sponsors, Birds of a Feather Coffee Company, BirdsCoffeeCompany.com. Migrate the flock on over to birdscoffeecompany.com. Whether you are a morning lark or a night owl like me, Birds Coffee Company has a brew to suit every birdie. So, yes, birdscoffeecompany.com. Birds of a feather. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> I, I, I would love a cup of coffee now. Yes, coffee is so Let's go over to birds of a feather. Yes. Anyways, yeah, so Miskatonic University is the, the next up. Sue O'Brien has been, been handling that. Um, and uh, she, she has been, you know, fine-tuning that. We play-tested that and showed it off at UK Game Expo. It'll be there at Gen Con um, oh. to show off on. And then... Um, uh, I don't think we will have, have it printed in time for Essen Spiel, but I think our hope is to have it printed by the end of the year. And then after that, I think next up on the block is to do Credo, um, which has actually been sitting in a holding pattern. Because Credo is, I don't know if you've ever played Credo. Credo is a near and dear game to me. But it is, um, it is a an exceptionally, it is one of those bits of artistic craziness that um, I'm really committed for us to do, uh, but it breaks a lot of rules doing it. It is a backstabbing game set around the Council of Nikea. And what you are is you're playing factions um, trying to determine the creed, the, the Christian creed at Nikea, largely by murdering your opponents, uh, blackmailing them, uh, uh, hiring barbarians to start wars and whatnot. So that, you know, because it really matters whether uh, uh, Jesus was the same substance um, but different body or different body, different substance or whatever, you know, all the, the writer of this, Chris Goodlow, who is amazing, um, used all historical uh, heresies and, and, and views of the time 
and you're sitting there, uh, you know, playing this game where you're trying, you're, you're playing a historical event where you're trying to, um, uh, uh, the players are trying to agree upon, you know, the emperor has made this the official religion of, of, of the Roman Empire. What is this religion? Tell me what it is. What do you guys believe in? And so you're forced to, to come up with this. And we like to joke that this is the only game where you could play, where you could be a seminary student and have the same degree of enjoyment as um, a, a, a hardcore atheist and would have the same degree of fun. And we actually did that uh, either last year or the year before, Jonathan Tweet and um, the gamer priest played a round of Credo and they had a wonderful time. So it's not a it's not a sectarian it it's not a sectarian game at all. It's just uh, it reflects our love of history and our love of of weird obscure events, uh, and that's going to be an interesting game to market. But it's beautiful. I mean, the cards all look like they're um, uh, Orthodox I icons. Uh, oh, cool. a Bulgarian uh, Bulgarian artist friend of mine, Colin uh, Kadev, did all of the cards in the, the the style that you would expect to see from an Orthodox church and beautiful game. And it's called so, Credo, uh, correct? Credo. It's a Credo. Credo. And although it sounds, you know, at first you're thinking, oh gosh, this sounds all about theology. It's all about backstabbing, murder, and Roman <laughs> politics. So, in a sense. His history is yeah. well. It's a the political history, history behind what we know. Yes, yes, and it's it's a it's. A, I find it to be a wonderful hoot of game. Okay. Um, but yeah, so that's what we've got in the product production line uh, right now on board games, and okay. I'm sure I've missed things. Oh yeah, Thirteenth Age. That is the art is per, is I believe. <coughs> I believe either Rob has finished the art or is on the last two pieces of art. And then that goes to layout. So you'll be getting that with the uh, Glorantha source book. Um, and the source book is, it is a collection of in Gloranthan material that um, some of it is stuff that Greg wrote and, um, back in the 70s and we've just updated and expanded and edited and, and and run loud with it but it's basically it's 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 almost all in glorantha so unlike the guide to glorantha which is an encyclopedia this is you know there's this big god learners section on what are the various pantheons of glorantha and their myths which is a great way of you know, having an overview of all sorts of different mythologies in the setting without having to try to say one is true or not true. Um, it's got the history of the Lunar Empire. It's, you know, it's it's got all sorts of things that I think are essential. Uh, we'll see what other people think, but, you know, I've at least had a blast putting it together. Awesome. And I, and I guess that's that's generally my approach on a lot of the the stuff we do is if I think something if we're doing something that is is just awesomely cool that I'm excited about then and that the rest of the people on the team are excited about then you know we want to roll the dice and see how that goes and because I think you know at, at, at a certain level what a role playing is, it's a, it is a small art form, but it is an art form. And, and, and whether you like it or not, what you're doing as a gamer is, um, even in your own game, you're creating a type of art. And uh, I personally think that when, as a publisher, you should take artistic risks to do things that you think are cool and interesting um, and 
Now, maybe some of them will pan, some of them won't pan out, but others of them will pan out spectacularly well because I think that there is a need for for stuff that feels like art, not stuff that feels like it was built by a, a corporate committee. Yes, right? and and you see this as people's complaints, even in in wonderful computer games. You know, where people have the complaints, it's often the stuff that feels like it was market tested. Ed. Uh, where that also, and then you can also sometimes if you play a video game through towards the back nine, you can start to tell, oh, this is where the budget ran out. Yep, they're they're yep. just trying to fill content and to make up for the fact that well, they've got to hurry up and beat deadline. And but, and 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 because what we're doing in 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 everything that we're producing is is theater of the imagination. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, what 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 we, at least to me, when I think a big part of a role is to come up with ideas and gameplay and such that gets you as the player or you as the GM or or you as the reader to get your imagination rolling and get excited. And then you know those video game budget problems aren't quite the same thing. No, they're not because depending on who the GM is, they could have let the players go off that rail. Because you know, you you are oh, involved yeah. with the writing of scenarios, and yes, players might chase that red herring to the point of, this makes no sense, you know. Uh, but a good GM will find a way to let the players go off that track, but still stay within the lines, right? Well, I mean, Just my, reformatting the uh, the layout. My own view as a GM is, as long as the everybody's having fun, yes, go with it. The published material is there to get everybody's imagination rolling, and whether they jump off the rails and never come back. That's not, in my opinion, that's not a problem. You know, you give them as a writer, you say, well, this is where I think it should go. Um, and you give people a lot of tools and a lot of ideas. But if, you know, the players decide at the first red herring to run off and run off the track and end up becoming, you know, canned fish salesmen, in some town down the coast that's happened before in a Call of Cthulhu game. Um, I, I actually am running a Cthulhu game right now where my players are in terrible, there's a terrible danger that they are actually going to be paying more attention to the bogus films that they are writing and producing as a <laughs> plot to anything else. I mean, yeah. Well, they're having a great time, and that's what matters. Is, yes. <laughs> and but but that's all part of the that's that I think that comes back to that you know we as publishers we're producing this strange form of art so that the people that read our product and play our product and, and GM with our product they can have that same, they don't have to have the same experience of what we're writing, but they can have that same excitement and enthusiasm and fun. Yes. So that's a long way to say that, that for me, you know, artistic interest is, you know, pretty much for the paramount of, of our decision for almost everything that we do. Excellent. Now, it's it's been about an hour, um, so Jeff, I think what I would like to do, since I've already interviewed you in the past, and you're familiar with the final five. Oh yes. Yeah. Now I've I've tried to change them up just a little bit to see if I'm not completely repeating myself here. Well, I will. <laughs> oh, okay. um, I'm, some of these I'm going to ask you again. Okay. Um, all right. And I probably will answer them differently this time. Okay. Video game or tabletop? Oh, I'm a tabletop. I, the, the, right now, the only I play 
I try to play a little bit of, a, of video games, mm -hmm. um, in part because it's important to know how stories are being assembled on a video game so that you have a point of reference because that 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 is how a lot of people understand uh fantasy or science fiction stories is is through the storylines in, in in video games but my problem is i i lack the and i think i said this last time i lack the the patience and the time to be able to play things through so I start a lot of games, I get to a point, and then I just kind of peter out. Tabletop, on the other hand, that's never a problem. Yeah. Star Wars, Star Trek, or Dune? Oh, now you're being cruel. Dune. <laughs> no, I, I think I, I did this the I last time. What? I think, I think we visited this the last time. Did I say Dune as well? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just actually reread um uh the the original Dune book uh, wow. a few weeks ago and I was amazed how well that held up. Absolutely amazed. And and also I was amazed how little um Herbert explained. I mean and and when it when things had when he had to give background it was given in dense in-world texts, and I actually found that made the book infinitely more interesting than something that was spoon-fed to me. I mean, I just love yes. the fact that there was a hot, yeah, you jumping into that, even if you know the story, there's still a high learning curve every time. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, um, and then I started reading the next in the series, and I did forget how, yeah. Um, how disappointing it became. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I was. There's some difficulties that, you know, you, you think about that. Okay, my whole story, I've created this great story, which is um, one way of reading about it is, is that the character finally succumbs to being the hero he doesn't want to, to be because he understands what that's going to be unleashing on the world. Does it? All right, what happens next? Well, next book. Everything that we've set up in the first book, it's all gone. Because mm. he won. And there's been a jihad and, and billions of people are dead. And and um yeah, and as a writer, you can just kind of go, Yeah, this is complicated. This is this is this is wiping out things on a scale that George R. R. Martin never would. I mean, mm -hmm. Martin at least doesn't get rid of entire. Well, and I think in the in the next book, let's just get rid of the entire continent of Westeros, because because <laughs> we can. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, that's a. Oh, Dune, it's a, it's okay. And after Dune, Star Wars. I love Star Trek, but Star Trek Star Trek to me is all about the interaction between Captain Kirk, Spock. And McCoy, the actual setting, I don't find terribly interesting, but I find those characters awesome. I actually find the characters in the original Star Trek better than the characters in Star Wars. But I find the setting and the opera that is Star Wars far more interesting than Star Trek. But I like doing better than both. Okay. <laughs> okay. Marvel or DC? Um, I'm pretty sure I said this before. I grew up on Marvel comics. Um, I grew up, uh, uh, you know, reading reprints of old Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko um, uh, comics, and so uh, you know things like Doctor Strange. Those old, do you remember those old original Steve Ditko with Doctor Strange doing the weird hand gestures um, yes. and the weird psychedelic art on it? That that still has a a gigantic impact um, on on what I do, uh, and and I I can't deny that some of my love for Glorantha comes from my love for Howard the Duck, you know, mm -hmm. duck. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really ever get into DC Comics in the same way. 
Now, nowadays with modern, with, you know, in the last 10 years, I think in general, DC has been doing more interesting stuff than Marvel, but that, Sadly, that doesn't make a difference to me. If I mean, if I'm actually really thinking about comic book stories that get me excited, it's you know Doctor Strange or the Incredible Hulk or the the old Avengers or early X Men. That to me is is quintessential comics in a way that that Superman or Batman never worked me. So I'm sorry, all you DC fans. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. If you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Whew, I know I had a good one last time and I've forgotten. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> I've totally forgotten on that. Um, you know, you kind of go through them. Uh, Super strength isn't actually all that terribly exciting, and invisibility is a little bit too pervy. Uh, and flying, you know, um, I actually think probably planes are more useful than having flying as a, a superpower overall. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to give one that I didn't have. What would be really nice is to be absurdly long lived and recover from stupid as a uh, as a superpower on, on on retrospect i'm thinking that the the wolverine's healing factor plus longevity not the poisoned wolverine of the, like sneaky things went up but just just being around for a long time that would be an awesome superpower especially if I had been around for a long time, I mean, wouldn't it be kind of cool to have, have, have been around in the 16th century and, uh, you know, lived through all of this, you know, lived through all of our past as a super power and not have to terribly worry about that the future is going to kill you as well. Yeah, that would be, that would be really yeah, How's that for my brain? Oh man. Yeah. Yes, that, that would be oh, awesome. Immortal, immortal dude. I, I don't <laughs> find anything any better. I don't have any great super psionic powers, but yeah, you know, I'm just not going to get killed. I, I just don't get killed when I'm down to zero hit points, and I, I don't make aging rolls. That, Unfortunately, cool. I'm, I'm going to have to speed this up because I hear my lawn crew is... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, last one. No, no. Uh, ba ba I think that was four. What job, if you were offered it, would make you drop everything and say yes to it? I've got a dream job right now. Did I lose you? No, no, you did not. Okay. I'm just trying to mute stuff because I hear lawnmowers. Um. I, I've got to say, you know, being the, the job of creative director for Chiasm is a pretty darn sweet job. Uh, yes. And I know uh, enough other people that, if, you know, I've had some, some, some pretty interesting jobs before, and I know people that are in other areas of the entertainment industry. And I, I think I actually have more fun than... Um, you know, more fun than in the movie industry. Certainly more fun. There is more fun doing uh, uh, creative development for Chaosium than at a large computer game company. So right now, right now it would just have to be for an astronomical amount of money. Astronomical amount of money. Right? Because astronomical amount of money, you know, that trumps anything. <laughs> yeah. Musical question. Quick yeah, musical yeah. question. What album can you listen to all the way through without skipping any tracks? Um, Exile on Main Street by the Rolling Stones. That would be one. Uh, any of the American records by Johnny Cash. Um, mm -hmm. I can uh, go all the way through and uh, both of those multiple times. And um, 
the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust. Oh. Those are all ones because I, I I I just did a very long drive, and those were all albums I I listened to all the way through straight, without switching. Awesome. Last one. Okay. What question do you wish I would have asked you today? Oh boy, I mean, I think. But here's the sad thing, Leah. Even if you didn't ask her ask a question. I just babbled on <laughs> and, 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 and said it anyway. So I, I think, uh, um, I, I, I don't think you missed anyone. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I, I guess in theory we could have had more tangents down random pop culture or, or, um, uh, influence areas, but, um, uh, Hey, I'm happy with the interview. It was, as far as I'm concerned, it was awesome. Okay. Well, um, we here at Legends of Tabletop would love to extend our thank you for so graciously offering your time and your presence for this interview. I really do appreciate it. it I is, cannot express. Leah, it is always a pleasure. And, and myself and anybody else on the Chiasium team, we are always happy to do it again. It is and, our pleasure because Legends of Tabletop, awesome. Okay. Um, I'm so excited to see Nick and Mike at Necronomicon in August. I look forward to it, you guys. And we will speak with you again later. Thank you for tuning in.